This is a 1911 National. The National Car Company started at the turn of the century building electric cars in Indianapolis. And uh, in about 1909, they started building gasoline-powered cars. And the president of the company was one of the four founders of the Indianapolis Speedway. So they decided that maybe they ought to try and win a race. So their goal was to win the Indy 500. So they entered three cars in the 1911 race. This one finished seventh, which was the highest placing car. And then in 1912, they won the race with Joe Dawson driving, not the same car in a different car. You say there's a lot of pressure, you know, what if I can't get it started? <laughs> well, the last guy that cranked it, we found his body in somewhere near Houston and his arm was in San Antonio. A lot of pressure. You know, I've got friends that refer to this car as the Smile Mobile, the Smile Mobile. Uh, it seems like wherever we go, people wave. Uh, it's it's so popular, uh, it, and it, you can't help but smile when you see the car go by. And we, you know, we we try to drive the car as hard as it can be driven. It's kind of an interesting story. Um, I have another national race car that was built in 1916. When I was restoring that car about 15, 20 years ago, I was trying to find some parts and talk to a fellow that had been referred to me and. He said, oh yeah, I know a buddy who's got a national race car in Indiana, but he swore me to secrecy. He didn't want anybody to ever know that it, his car had been a race car. Because back in the 50s, when he bought the car, a car that had been raced is a car that had been abused, and it lowered the value of the car. So he swore all his buddies to secrecy. The steering wheel of, of this car had all the driver's names carved into it, and he carefully sanded all the names off the wooden steering wheel. This this car has a four-cylinder, 460 cubic inch engine, so each, each cylinder displaces over 100 cubic inches. It's hand started by hand. You have to crank this thing. Uh, it has two spark plugs per cylinder. It's what's called a T-head. The exhaust exits on one side of the cylinder and the intake comes in on the other side of the cylinder. It's an updraft carburetor. The car has a, a number of controls that most people aren't familiar with. The, uh, it has a, a, a foot throttle and a hand throttle. It has an adjustment for the spark advance on the steering wheel. It has to be retarded when I hand crank this to, to, to start it. It has a foot brake as well as a handbrake. The foot brake operates the rear band on the outside of the drum and the handbrake operates the internal band on the inside of the drum. None of these cars built prior to World War I have any front wheel brakes and of course as you know front ones, front brakes do all the work so brakes are almost non-existent in this car. You learn real fast that if you're in an emergency situation you don't use your brakes, you use your steering wheel and get around the obstacle rather than try and stop before you hit the obstacle. It has a pressure tank that is pressurized by the riding mechanic. His job is to pump pressure into the fuel tank and into the oil tank. And that pressure pushes the oil and fuel up into the engine. Yeah, there's, the gauges are kind of unique. If you see here, the only two gauges on here are an air pressure gauge, which goes from one to four pounds, and we try and keep it around two pounds, and an oil flow gauge. It's not a pressure gauge. All it is is just a pipe that comes up, it dribbles down, and then drains right back into the engine again. If at any point in time there's no oil dribbling out, we know we've run out of oil, we have to open a valve, fill the crankcase back with oil again while we're running, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, keep the engine from, from, uh, from being damaged. I, uh, I quit racing motorcycles when we started having kids because of a deal I made with my wife. The deal didn't say anything about racing cars. So in 1983, I found a Formula 5000 Lola in pieces, put it together, and went racing. And uh, since then, I've raced everything from 1911 pre-war cars to 1974 Formula 2, Can-Am cars, NASCAR, you name it. Yeah, owning a car like this is different than, than owning any of the more modern race cars in many ways. And it's interesting, more people seem to identify with it, especially people who don't know a lot about racing. 
they see this as an old antique car that's obviously a race car. Whereas they look at a Can-Am car and yeah, that's a big loud car, but there's a whole bunch of others that look just like it. That, and I can't tell the difference between one or the other, but this one kind of you know, sticks its head out, so to speak.